guess what? Yep, I did it. And I did that, and I did that. Damn right I was mad. <laughs> was I confused? Of course I was. I still fight for people to see me as an adult. So that's why I turned around and said, hey, you. I did not want to do it at all. Still trying to be a kid, and that just went out the window. The moment I knew, I was like, whoop, oh, here we go. I'm gonna be honest, because what else, what else are you gonna do? Leanne has the, the, the greatest natural voice I've ever heard. It's just an incredible voice. She's inspiring to listen to. Like me. Leanne is one of the most naturally gifted singers I've ever worked with. It's magic what she does. Leanne's talent just really transcends the boundaries of radio formats and classification, really, because she's a classic singer. Leanne has really just created her own niche. There's no one like her. Michael McDonald, uh, Lionel Richie, Randy Travis, Reba McIntyre. The minute they start singing, you know the voice. Well, the minute Leanne had the big hit blue, from that point on, you always knew the voice. We all knew when we heard Blue being sung by Leanne the first time around that something was odd. Something, you know, this should be coming out of this, this girl. She can perform anything. She can do jazz. She can do swing. She can do country. She can do torch. There's very little that she can't do. I think if the woman wanted to make a polka record, she'd probably succeed at that. She can pick up a melody a tone of something that she sang seven years ago and, and just starts singing, oh, it was this key, and, and I'll go to the piano and go, you're right, and um, it's freaky. I think she um, understands herself better when she sings. You know, that's a, a good way to do it. When she sings, she goes, it kind of opens a door uh, for her to understand herself. That's the best way I can say it. In fact, I think sometimes the music has saved her, has helped her through hard times. I think it's in a roundabout way my mom was right. <laughs> the music of Margaret Leanne Rimes has indeed been her saving grace throughout a turbulent and well-documented career of professional peaks and personal valleys. She entered the world on a hot summer day in Mississippi as an answer to the prayers of Wilbur and Belinda Rhymes. Having struggled to conceive for over a decade, the couple finally gave birth to their only child on August the 28th, 1982. I lay down on the bed one day and I just prayed. I said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll give that child back to you. And I, I said, I pray that she'll be special for you. Six weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. They had trouble having children, my mom and dad, and um, it took her 12 years to get pregnant with me. So I was definitely her miracle child. She was a gift from God. It was just meant to be. I've heard the story five million times. It's so funny because moms can be moms will be moms. Moms will tell the story, and they you know of their beautiful children. They want to show you pictures. Well, mine's like five million times that. She was born August the 28th, and she came out crying, and she hasn't shut up yet. <laughs> She's been singing ever since. Wilbur and Belinda doted on their only child, and Leanne was constantly surrounded by the music they loved. Music was such a big part of my life growing up and her father's life. So when she was little, um, we sang to her all the time. I sang one for him. People ask me now, where did she get that voice? 
and I think that she got her voice from her father. I think her daddy was a big inspiration as to teach her how to feel a song. He always said that you've got to sing it from here, but you'll never know how to really sing it from there until you've had your heart broken. Wilbur had been around show business a little bit in Dallas and in that area and had had Leanne on those talent contests and uh, they understood it at that level. Uh, but he had been recording her too from the time she was really small. Uh, so they knew that they had something really special. Wilbur Rhymes encouraged Leanne's early aptitude for singing, but when he realized the full extent of Leanne's extraordinary gift, he sold everything and moved the family to Texas, where there were more opportunities to perform. Pageants and talent shows whetted Leanne's appetite for the stage, but it was winning that sealed her fate. And after she won, she was hooked. She said, I want to be a singer. And I said, are you sure? And I kept asking her that. Even as she got older, I said, are you sure this is what you want to do? And she never faltered from that. No one drove me. I definitely pretty much drove that car um, when I was pushing most people to go, you know, take me and do this, and I want to sing at this. And the only time I'd ever get, like, really quiet was when someone really wanted to, like, it wasn't me being on stage or me doing performing. It was someone wanted to really compliment me as a kid and my godfather, we'd go into the Waffle House and he'd be like, do you know who this is? Yeah, well, she's gonna be huge one day and sing, Leanne sing. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> like that was the only time that I ever was like really shy. Um, but other than that, no, I would pretty much, that's what I wanted to do. With Leanne's desire to sing and Wilbur's drive to expose her talent, the Rhymes family now centered on getting Leanne on stage whenever and wherever they could. Johnny High's music review became a frequent stop for Leanne, and Johnny High himself, one of her most ardent supporters. No matter how long I had actually sung on, on the show, he was always mesmerized. It was always this wide-eyed, and he was so proud of everything that I did, and every time I walked on stage, and so he was one of the biggest supporters that I've ever had in life. She is something really, really, really special. She's, as I said, she's nine years old. Would you give a big hand to Miss Lee Ann Rimes? She sang crazy. It just makes chills go all over you. It must have seemed to Wilbur and Belinda Rhymes like they had just won the lottery, literally. back at nine years old she was she was 20 at nine years old mentally she was just she just got it I loved performing there that gave me a platform to really kind of you know get my bearings of how to do this thing Leanne got a standing ovation pretty much every night no doubt about it she it's just I think her voice was as good at nine years old as it is now Coming up on Backstory. Who knows if we were all on power trips at the time. Before she was country music sweetheart, Leanne Rhymes had spent much of her Texas childhood being ferried from venue to venue by her parents in an attempt to get her remarkable voice heard. By the time she was 11, Leanne was a seasoned entertainer and had even won a round on Star Search. Unfortunately, she still hadn't won a major recording deal, which was her father's ultimate goal. There's a lot of people who, you know, in the business, like, didn't know what to do with me. You know, it's, she's a kid. Well, how do we market this? There was a very powerful record executive here in Nashville that told Leanne she was just too young. You know, go back, grow up, you know, <laughs> put on a training bra. <laughs> no, it, but that rejection, I think, pushed her uh, and her family to look for somebody who could do it uh, and do it now. When someone tells me no or something, someone's better than you at that, I'm going to work always super hard to make sure I'm as good or better. While Leanne worked to improve her talent, Wilbur Rhymes worked to get her a record deal. 
Eventually, Wilbur's work paid off, and Leanne's demo tape made its way into the hands of Mike Curb, head of Curb Records in Nashville. And you know how a lot of times you hear a tape and you say, wait a minute, this isn't the tape of the person. Sometimes people take a tape and they record over some other artist. I said, this is not a 13, this is not a 12 or 13 year old girl. It sounds like Patsy Cline. So uh, we played a couple of songs and I said, well, then this must, this isn't the, this must not be the tape. Eventually, Mike Curb was convinced that it actually was Leanne singing. His first call was to Wilbur Rhymes to offer Leanne a contract, and his second was to booking agent Rod Essig. I don't think I've asked Rod two times in my life to come over to my office and hear an artist, and that was one of the times. And when I heard her in Mike Curb's office, after maybe 30 seconds, I go, I'm in, let's go, what are we gonna do? Let's, I wanna be your agent. This was a great voice, and it was like an adult voice in, in the body of a, of a young girl. Uh, I actually couldn't believe it. And that was what was magic about her at the time, was she was so young, yet when she opened her mouth, it was just like nothing you'd ever heard. Leanne's captivating voice had worked its magic on Mike Curb most powerfully in her rendition of Blue, one of the songs on Leanne's demo tape. And since Curb wanted to release a single quickly, the decision was made to stick with what first captured his attention. To take her and cut a song that was over 30 years old at the time, uh, and it sounded like she yodeled, uh, it, was, it was a big risk because you had uh, Faith Hill and Shania and uh, uh, Winona's records. I mean, those were some really strong statements being made by females at the time that ran completely counter to what Leanne Rimes was introducing with Blue. The mid and the late 90s were the days of Faith and Shania and showing the midriff and sexing up country to be a little bit more pop. But here was this wholesome 13 year old whose dad was her manager. And um, she brought a different look and a different sound to country. And she did do something a little bit different than what was on the mainstream radio, but they did catch on eventually. Now that it's When we signed her and she came out with Blue, it was like a rocket ship. Normally, you take two years, three years, you develop an act. Leanne Ryan's was six, six months. And here's Leanne, her first single, out of the box, monster hit. As soon as Blue got on the radio, the record started selling. The press just went crazy. She started doing the late night television shows. She was in demand on the road. They couldn't keep her records in stock at the retail stores. The album, quickly goes platinum, then twice, then three times, then four million, then five million. Uh, and I think the album is at around seven times platinum now. The sales of Blue catapulted 13-year-old Leanne Rimes to superstar status and were followed by even bigger albums and singles, charting higher and across multiple formats. The success was greater than Leanne had ever imagined, but she quickly felt the pressure of being an artist in demand. How many 13-year-old girls have a monster country hit and a monster gospel hit and, and a monster pop hit when they're 13. Uh, that was a pretty big culture shock to the whole family. And everyone wanting Peace View at some point and still trying to be a kid and that just went out the window because there was no time for that. Coming up on Backstory. I think I felt really, you know, abandoned. I think abandoned is a really good word. teen sensation Leanne Rimes was doing things no other artist had done before. The success of her album Blue had garnered her two Grammys in platinum sales, and her wall-to-wall -wall bookings were the envy of every agent in Nashville. Leanne's career had taken off and was quickly gaining speed. It's a rocket ship. It's going through the roof. It's going fast, and it's everybody's dream. 
to have something happen this fast. I was grateful, obviously, for the success. I don't think anyone was prepared for that kind of success. I don't care if I was 30. No one is prepared for that. You know, before it would be 16, 18, 20 weeks to get a number one record. Leanne had three of number one records going at one time. With multiple singles topping multiple charts, Wilbur Rhymes and co-manager Lyle Walker went with their gut instincts to keep Leanne on the road while she was hot. He seemed protective, but he was uh, uh, insistent that she become a star and that, that people hear her voice. When it started going, and she'd been about 12 years old, again, mom and dad and Lyle, they're all on the road, and it was going. It was like going through the roof. And we went from making, you know, at that point, $10,000 to $100,000 in two weeks. It was this old way of thinking. It's like, you know, you capitalize on it while it's happening, and you know, don't stop now, I'm just in the middle of everything. And I was like, hold on, like, I want longevity in this business. I need to stop for a second. I'm thinking, Leanne, you just got to suck it up and do this thing. You got to, you got to keep, don't stop until, I mean, you're young, you have this energy, but she was too young, I think. Her father died, he'd be on the phone talking to me and we'd be arguing and, and she'd say, I can't believe you're arguing with my dad and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And I said, Leanne, I wasn't arguing in that. I was looking down and you were working 13 and 14 days in a row and some of those in those days were two shows in a day. I said, I was telling your father he had to stop. Her father and I just did not agree on what the things that, the way things should have been done. I thought they should just be slowed down, take a breath, us regroup and try to, um, you know, to straighten things out and just slow down our lives a little bit. I remember looking in Belinda's eyes and she took my hands backstage at one of Leanne's concerts and she said, oh, Wade, pray for us, pray for us. Uh, it, it was a serious jolt to the family. From the time I was 14 to 16 and a half, I did 500 shows in that three and a half years. So I was worn out when I was 16 and a half. <laughs> and um, I was done. I remember her crying on the phone saying, this is wearing me completely out. I'm like, Leanne, you gotta be tough, hang in there. It's like, you don't understand, and I didn't. I felt like I lost my daughter at a young age. And it's a horrible feeling. It feels like both she and her father went on, on a, a airplane flight, and they it crashed, and they never came back. Ultimately, the responsibility of flying the rocket ship of Leanne Rimes' exploding career rested squarely on the shoulders of her parents. And it was a ship neither was fully prepared to steer. There's a number of controversial things that I would argue with with Wilbur and try and slow it down. And you, just, you have to do, you have to take that responsibility. And again, he's, he's the final boss. We just thought Leanne was gonna get on stage and sing and be able to do that the rest of her life and just, you know, make her living at it and be happy and, and everything goes smoothly. We had no idea how it really worked. By that time, we had a, there was a truck on the road, there was a bus on the road, she had a full-time band. So I'm sure Wilbur was, was, getting, was going, how are we gonna pay all these people? When you start to make money for your record company, they pay themselves before they ever pay you. And I think that that uh, was probably something that kept Wilbur up nights a little bit, worrying about how that was all gonna come down. The records are going through the roof, but you don't get paid on the records until six or eight months later. And then you'd get a two or three million dollar check. Well, when you're not used to that kind of world, you don't expect that to happen. With money pouring in and Leanne's continued success on the road, Wilbur Rhymes pushed for more dates and headlining status. On the outside, Leanne seemed to be living a country music dream come true. But on the inside, her body was ready to call it quits. She was playing Grand Junction. It was a big festival. And again, I'm, I think that run was eight or nine days. And she was headlining. This was a Brian White, Leanne Rimes headline tour. And she said, I don't feel good. I had the flu and 104 fever and I went out and performed anyway. And I sat on a stool and I remember right before, I, I think I got like five or six songs through and I said, I, I said I'm so sorry, I, I'm really not feeling well. Literally started going, looked at this and I went out and she fell in my arms. I just collapsed. I don't even remember what happened. I just remember I passed out. And she goes, Rod, we have to pull the tour. I can't, I cannot maintain this anymore. And so we, we, we canceled for two weeks and just sent everybody home and sent her home. 
and just said, sleep, sleep, sleep. It was just exhaustion. It's been written that uh, no seasoned artist could have ever done, has ever done what we did. So I just think it was a very impossible task, which took a, took a toll on the family. After years of obediently following her father's lead, Leanne began to question his authority and the direction of her career. Not surprisingly, tension mounted in the Rhymes household. Well, it's inevitable. I mean, we're all human, so we're gonna argue, and people are gonna have different opinions, and I should do this, but I don't wanna do that, and I'm tired, and but just do one more thing, and you know, there's a lot of that, and I'm really sick, well, but we have to do this. Well, I, you know, I can't. I'm passing out. <laughs> can't do it. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of arguments. The constant arguing began to take its toll on the family, specifically on Belinda and Wilbur's marriage. Their differences over how to manage Leanne's career, among other things, had slowly eroded their relationship. I just saw our family unraveling, and we just couldn't hang on. And it was just, we were all going different directions. And it was just very hard, very hard. My dad actually came up to my room one day and said, I'm getting, we're getting a divorce. And I honestly looked at him and said, thank God. I was 14, I knew, like, I knew a relationship wasn't supposed to be that. So I was like, thank you. We all went through a period of, of brokenheartedness, um, and we were trying to deal with it the best we knew how. And my, my, for me, the saddest part for me is that I fell apart when she needed me the most. I think I felt really, you know, abandoned. I think abandoned is a really good word. Um, because of a divorce and because of, um, not only that, but it was, the divorce became much bigger because it was so publicized and um, my mom felt like she lost me to the world at, you know, 13. She lost her child at 13, really. Um, and then I lost, my dad was more my manager and I lost my dad, um, you know, and that those relationships like totally changed. Um, so, Abandoned is a really good way to explain how I felt, even though I had all these people loving me and, oh, my God, you're amazing. It was not the kind of love that um, a child at 14 needed. You had a young girl that was in the middle of a career who lost faith and trust in, the, in people that she dearly loved. I didn't really know till later how that was going to affect me because I really didn't have time to mourn it. You know, I didn't have time to deal with it. Uh, there was too much else going on. From an artist standpoint, I remember thinking, well, this is all you ever want. You can just deal with family issues later. That's no problem. This is your goal. This is your dream. Uh, go with it. Just go with it. And just how insensitive I was looking back on it. I had discussions with her, but uh, she knew there there was nothing she could do uh, about that split. It's just so so sad because a teenager going through parents going through a divorce, you usually turn to your friends and not turn to cameras to have to talk about it. Coming up on backstory. The only one that knew was him. So, damn right I was mad. <laughs> At age 15, Leanne Rhymes should have been having the time of her life, but years of non-stop touring and the divorce of her parents had tarnished the shine of her childhood dreams. The sweet country singer who'd won countless fans with her big voice and crinkly smile had lost a little of herself along the way. 
Well, I used to say, you know, I didn't miss out on anything, and I didn't at the time. Like, I wasn't thinking that how it was going to affect me as an adult. I don't think anyone else was either. Um, my mom and dad did what they could do for me, the best they knew how, and so did everyone else. But um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I lost a lot of innocence, and I lost a lot of myself that probably there was so much that was overdeveloped as an adult and so much that was underdeveloped as a child that I didn't have a, quite the balance inside of me to, you know, I was always this adult, but I didn't, the child in me hadn't really grown up. She was so busy and, and so distracted, people hitting her from every angle, her trying to find out why she is special, so to speak. Um, why, why, am I, why am I so special, told I'm special everywhere I go, yet these problems in the background are, are hitting me. And I, I just, I really honestly look back on it and I, I really feel sorry for, for her. Caught in the gap between childhood and adulthood, Leanne began to test the boundaries that had held her in place for years. A move to Los Angeles with her mother allowed Leanne to slip out from under her father's thumb as he continued to run the ship back in Nashville. And a new boyfriend, Hollywood hunk Andrew Keegan, introduced Leanne to a faster LA lifestyle. When we moved to, um... Uh, Los Angeles, and of course she had a boyfriend at that time. <laughs> Andrew Keegan. <clears throat> I liked Andrew, I, I, not as much as he liked Andrew, but I, I really did, I liked Andrew. I was with him for three and a half years, very, very young relationship, you know? Um, I mean, was I confused of where I was supposed to be and how, like I said, to be an adult, to be a child, or what do I do and who do I listen to and who do I trust? And yeah, of course I was. A boyfriend took the place, I guess you could say, of the father image because he was gone. Um, it was a devastating time. And that was, yeah, that was a huge fight with parents. That was fun. The battles with her parents created even more distance among the family members, and Leanne broadened the gap when she started making her own career decisions without her parents' input. But with her new friends, she was rarely at a loss for advice. When the divorce happened and the new boyfriends and, and the West Coast lawyers and, you know, managers and all that got into the picture, uh, we just, we felt we were just lucky if we got an album, you know, so we just waited like we do, you know, let all these new geniuses who had nothing to do with it tell us what to do, you know. She had some friends at times that were not always the greatest friends, and we were worried about that. A lot of these people who wouldn't give her the time of day, you know, before she had a hit, they started telling her what she should do, you know. Living in L.A. also brought a new set of problems for Leanne, the tabloids. Having caught their attention with her family drama and Hollywood boyfriend, Leanne became a frequent target, often bearing the banner of rebellious teenager bent on destruction. I wrecked my Ferrari and I wrecked this night. I mean, none of it was true. Yes, I had a Ferrari but I didn't wreck it, and I didn't, like, I wasn't on drug binges or, like, anything like that. <laughs> so I think I kept it together pretty well. After years of working side by side, Leanne's relationship with her father, Wilbur, had deteriorated to the point that she was unwilling to continue. Frustrated with the way he and partner Lyle Walker were handling her career and her money, Leanne continued to distance herself from the management team. With help from her mother, 17-year-old Leanne took control of the situation the only way she knew how. I wanted to know what was happening with my money, so I, um, I hired some lawyers and investigators to go into figuring that out. She didn't like the money that her father was making off of her career. She didn't see that money going into her own bank account, so she took matters into her own hands. From my perspective, they always I always felt Lyle Walker and Wilbur Rhymes were doing a very good job. Uh, but from Leanne's perspective, uh, she wanted to build her own team. People changed. New people came in the picture, and she needed to get her company. And, and restructure it, and she needed to get her own company in her own name. The ensuing power struggle between Leanne and her father played out in a very public forum when she and her mother filed suit against Wilbur and partner Lyle Walker in May of 2000. 
Allegations of financial mismanagement were at the heart of the lawsuit, a convoluted case considering Leanne was still a minor. For child stars, you have to have a parent involved. You have to have a parent involved, whether they're the day-to-day -day manager or the manager, whether they make every decision or just the important ones for the kid. But then there came a time where Leanne wanted, uh, you know, had a new boyfriend and, uh, had a, and wanted different management, you know, and wanted the managers to take less. And, you know, it's a funny thing when you're, when you're out performing and getting $100, if you take 20%, that's $20. But when Leanne was making $20 million, 20% uh, was a lot more. You know, money changes people. Um, I think, uh, who knows if we were all on power trips at the time um, in different ways. Uh, but money changes people. Uh, money puts a di division in between family, obviously. And uh, I think, um, I just wanted my dad that coached my softball team back. I didn't want him to be my manager anymore. And so I think that was the only way to do it. That was the only way I knew how at the time was just to fight it. As the family fighting intensified, Wilbur Rhymes countersued and the media scrutiny was amplified by several decibels. The name calling and mudslinging within the Rhymes camp essentially became public domain. Anytime there's a major change like this, in the entertainment world, it's hard because artists are everything so public. To be a teenager and to be at war with your family like that and have the press taking sides. So many people were taking sides. People were calling into radio stations. Whose side are you on, Wilbur's or Leanne's? Well, I remember a lot of talk around town at the time that, oh, we didn't see any drama with this child star and now the drama's here. Well, I think a lot of the drama was personal drama. I don't think the town in the industry and certainly the fans, I don't think they had any sense of how painful all that was. A lot of what made this difficult was that little little disagreements she might have had with her dad, you know, that could have happened at a dinner table, ended up happening in a courtroom or in, ended up happening on a TV camera. My heart was in the right place. I was just growing up, you know. Um, I was very thankful for what they've done. And what you know, they have continued to always do. Um, but I think I really just wanted my freedom. Leanne's quest for freedom eventually broadened to her relationship with Curb Records. Now 18, she filed yet another lawsuit to annul the recording contract, which had been enacted when she was only 12 years old. When an artist um, signs and they're under the age of 18, the court has to give an approval and the artist has to appear before the judge and say, I understand that I'm underage, it's called a court affirmation. I think she was seeking to overturn that. If Leanne could overturn the affirmation, the contract her parents had signed on her behalf with Curb Records would be effectively invalid. As it stood, she was required to record a number of gospel, pop, and country albums for many years to come. Leanne signed her recording contract when she was 12. By the time she was 18, she was a music industry expert. She knew what she had gotten herself into, and she didn't like it. I had actually already talked to her manager about readjusting her contract, because at that point, doing that extra album each year for gospel didn't make any sense because she was out on the West Coast at Playboy parties and everything. We couldn't have put a gospel album out at that point if we had wanted to. The months of legal wrangling came to a dramatic climax in a Nashville courtroom on March 16, 2001, when a judge denied Leanne's request to end her contract with Curb Records. Upon hearing the ruling, Leanne railed at her father. The reason I said that um, was because the judge had told me during that uh, meeting that he had met me when I was 11 and that I had told him that I knew what I was signing. And during that time period, I know for a fact that I was with Rod Essig at his house. So basically, what happened was, I, people in that courtroom lied. And it was, so I was, I, I was stuck in a place where I didn't want to be. And my dad knew it. Everyone in that courtroom knew it. So that's why I turned around and said, hey, you. I don't think there were any other words that could have come out of my mouth at that time. It's because it's like, hello, somebody 
please stand up and tell the truth here for like five seconds. And the only one that knew was him. So, damn right I was mad. <laughs> Eventually, Leanne and her father called a truce and settled their differences over money and mismanagement. She also renegotiated a more favorable contract with Curb Records and tried to move her career forward, this time as an adult on her own terms. We made a new contract with her lawyer, you know, under the terms that she wanted. And uh, actually, I, believe it or not, I enjoyed it, that, that part of it. I enjoyed watching Leanne uh, negotiate. And, and at one point after the meeting, she said, you know, a lot of the things I said today, you taught me. Taking charge of her life also included Leanne's unexpected marriage to dancer Dean Shermay, whom she'd met only months before. And if that wasn't proof enough, her controversial pose on the cover of Blender magazine shortly after signaled an official end to her childhood. In every aspect of her life, Leanne desperately tried to convince the world that she was no longer the child star they'd first come to love. I think it was just like, hey, I'm an adult, I'm a woman. Here I am, you know, I'm, I'm growing up, you know? It's like you were, f I was fighting for people to see me as an adult. I still fight for people to see me as an adult. Finally, I think I'm getting there. I think that Leanne would push the limits. When, when she had her body where she wants it, I think she'll always push the limits. There were times where I thought maybe Leanne, uh, I, 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 was, I would talk to her, Leanne, I, I don't know if I would do this or that. And she's like, just trust me, I know what I'm doing. And that was just kind of the beginning of trying to make that statement of, I am a woman. But, you know, that was just the beginning of, of pretty much a, a long, long battle. Coming up on Backstory. Oh no, I didn't think that, no, I didn't do it the right way. When multifaceted artist Leanne Rimes released This Woman in 2005, fans embraced her new music and seemed ready to forget Leanne's rocky entry into adulthood. The bitter lawsuits with her father and Curb Records, as well as the tabloid's relentless harassment, appeared to be firmly in her past, and Leanne was eager to move forward. Well, emotionally it took a while, obviously, what I was seeking with my father. Um, but, and I, I know he still doesn't like to hear about it, so please don't watch this. Um, you know, and I, I hate talking about it because I do love my dad very much, so, um, and I do respect my dad, and I know he did what he could do for me at the time. And he, what, he, he was going through different things in his life too, so I get it, like, I really do. I'm sure that they look back on those times and think about a lot of things they might have done differently, but don't we all? In the course of working through the valleys of her career and personal life, Leanne began collaborating with veteran songwriter Daryl Brown. Their working relationship blossomed into a deep and healing friendship, which has been an anchor for Leanne ever since. He's such an amazing, incredible human being. I had said the other day, um, <laughs> I started talking about my friends, I'm gonna cry. If there was an angel to walk the earth, it would be him, truthfully. But he's just amazing. I know there's some kind of soul thing going on. I don't know, some kind of soul thing. I think we're supposed to walk these song lines together. You know, that's the best way I can say it. Just writing, I think I found a soulmate and a writing partner. There, there's there's a, a greater thing going on. You know, I don't, I don't know what it is until we get there, but I'm totally willing to go the distance, you know. Their friendship unearthed a song that was written from a place of deep pain and frustration. What I cannot change proves the healing power of forgiveness. The song is mostly about my dad, mom and dad, to be honest, um, because after my lawsuit with my dad, and um, I really was kind of, I didn't really have a really close relationship with my mom. Um, I missed that at some point, and uh, I think I had an argument with my dad or something one day when I came over to Daryl's house, and um, he, I just started crying and talking about what was going on in my life, and you know, the, it, that song really was about wanting to. I can't change the people in my life, but I can change the way I react to them. Um, and I can grant more grace because that's who they are. They're not changing. And um, I can just accept.
This song was fully realized one night on a stage in Las Vegas. It was the first time she performed it in front of a large crowd. She was on a proscenium stage, the crowd's all around her, and they're like right there. She leaned back and said, let's do what I cannot change. And she ended up starting to do the song. And as she started doing it, you know, she just started closing her eyes and she was just went to this place and she started opening her eyes and she saw these people bawling in the front row. I mean, I was standing on the side of the stage and you could see her just like, you know, her little trembling happen. I said, oh my God, what's happening, what's happening? And literally at the end of the song, she lost it. She came off the stage shaking. Again, got my, my, my hug, my arms and just shaking and, and the crowd was just like, and there, and, there, and there were people that were just crying and crying. And then, oh wow, at that point, applause started happening. And then as applause started happening, they didn't stop. And then the more they didn't stop applauding, the more she just kept on crying and laughing. And it was like this sheet had been torn away. And, um, and, and there she was. It was just, she was just revealed at that moment. And, and that sheet's never going back. To be that honest with someone, especially with a song like What I Cannot Change, that is just bare bones of this is me. It was an unbelievable experience. I want her to do it all the time. I love going to that place. I think it's, it's, it's a magical place. You get closer to God when that's going on. By her mid-twenties, Leanne Rimes had faced more drama than some people face in a lifetime. Her meteoric rise to fame as a child star, the devastating breakup of her parents' marriage, and the public fallout with her manager father could have left her broken and defeated. The pain, however, only served to make her stronger. So when Leanne first graced the cover of Shape magazine, all the public saw was a strong young woman, very much at peace with her body and herself. To see myself on the cover of Shape the first time in a bathing suit was, I think I bawled when I saw it because I just never thought that that would ever happen. What her fans didn't yet know was that Leanne struggled with psoriasis, a debilitating skin disease she'd battled since childhood. Her career in the spotlight had necessitated one cover up after another, while the disease severely wounded her fragile self-image. It was very traumatic as a child, and especially being in the public eye. We took her to the best doctors here in Dallas. Um, I would take her and she would have to go through a series of, um, of ointments and wraps and things to that effect. Uh, and then um, we would have to do that at home as well. It was horrible for a child to have to go through this. I had patches on my legs like this big. You know, and like it would, it would itch and bleed, and like my whole stomach would be covered. And that was when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20. I mean, not till a few years ago did I really get it under control because of the medication I found. For her to come forward with her psoriasis, a secret that none of us knew and none of us really had to know, was such a brave thing for her. She says a lot of feelings connected to it, you know. She can talk about it. You know, I'm very mature right now, but. She has a lot of feelings connected to um, her looks with that old memory than anything else about herself. But I'm empowered now to talk about it. And but once again, this thing about being perfect, it's like, well, well, I'm human, you know? And I have this skin disorder that over seven million people just in America alone have. So to come out and talk about it has empowered me, but it's also, you know, uh, I've gotten so many doctors that say, you know, there's these kids or adults, even women, who say, well, if Leanne Rhymes can have it, I can deal with it too, because, you know, she's seen everywhere and I don't even have to deal with it that, you know, on that big of a scale. So, I mean, if that's what I'm doing by talking about it, then I, I think that obviously I was given it for a reason. Leanne's newfound confidence with her skin and physique extended from magazine covers to the screen as she explored acting opportunities. When she was approached for the lead in a Lifetime movie, Northern Lights, she initially turned it down. But once she reached the frigid Canadian location, she found herself warming up to leading man, Eddie Sibrian. 
I did not want to do it at all. I was I had toured all year, and I was like, oh God, please don't make me go to Canada for four weeks. Um, and yeah, I don't even <laughs> know what to say. Um, we met and became very good friends. He was very shy at first um, with me, very, very shy. I guess it was slightly intimidating. And he didn't know what to think of me. And of course, he's an actor. And I'm like, first of all, he's like, okay, I'm going to go act with Leanne Rhymes. And most people are like, well, she's really done much. So nobody really knew what to expect. And it was really kind of my first real film to do as an adult. And I was terrified um, and had no idea, kind of like, I mean, I've done music videos, but I, I didn't know like how an actual movie really worked. And um, he was, you know, pleasantly surprised, thank God, and so was I, that it actually worked, and we had chemistry, and it was pretty instant, like, it was, but it, we were both super shy with each other and about it, um, because obviously we were both married, so it was, it was very odd, <laughs> um, and by the end of it, we were, you know, really good friends, and we spent a lot of time together on set, so we got to know each other well, um, and then it just kind of snowballed after that. Leanne went up and was very involved in the movie. And there were issues at home. And uh, so bottom line is they um, really got along. And it just kept going and going. She kept saying, you know, I'm, I have someone else. I'm really, it, it's fun in my life, and this is great. We had uh, a lot of scenes together um, that were very intimate the first couple of days. And um, it was. Uh, we, I remember shooting a scene with him and we walked away, we couldn't look at each other. I was like, this is awkward, I can't, I can't do this. Um, I think everyone saw it too, everyone was kind of like, no one would want to talk about it. We kind of avoided each, each other the first week and after the first week we, finally I was like, um, we were all, everybody was, you know, going home. We were like, we were bored, but I was bored. I was like, let's go have a drink, like, let's go get a burger. Because I need, I really did need to get to know him to finish the film. Like we really, and it was, it was just awkward. The awkwardness quickly passed between Leanne and Eddie, and their on-screen chemistry erupted into a full-blown love affair. Not surprisingly, the ever-present paparazzi sniffed out the truth and caught the two in a romantic tryst. And with two high-profile celebrities involved, both who happened to be married to other people, there was no stopping the tabloids from breaking the story. She was working. Uh, at her place, and she had basically got news that a tabloid was going to break a story. All I remember was getting the call about it. We talked about it. Um, the first person I called was Dean. The first thing I noticed was like, oh my God. You know, she just had this oh my God moment. Then the second one was bravery. And she, you know, her and Dean spoke. And the second person I called was my mom. She did call and forewarn me, and uh, I was just like, okay, here we go again. I'm shocked, uh, you know, so we just um, dealt with it as, it as it came, you know. Then I started making the rounds of calling people, and I, what do I say, except I'm gonna be really honest with you, this is what's going on. And then after that was the breaking down. And I just said, this sucks, but this is what's happening, and I, it's gonna come out on Wednesday, and I have to tell you about it. And so, I didn't need to yet. I didn't know how to handle it yet. So um, with the world, I wasn't ready to talk about it. But with my family and everybody else, the, I mean, the moment I knew, I was like, whoop, oh, here we go. I'm going to be honest, because what else, what else are you going to do? She's not one to run away, you know. She, it, that was a really hard time for both of them. The mistakes that celebrities make seem to be magnified about 100%. And I think what the public that consumes those sort of things uh, fails to remember is that we're all in the same boat. We all make bad decisions. We all make bad mistakes. We all do things that we wish we could take back and we could do over. I know that she's not happy the way things went down. She's told me that. Uh, but they did happen. I know I didn't do it the right way. Um, I, you know, I didn't have the tools to know how to do it the right way, how to let go the right way. Um, I've never been taught that. Now I do, and I have the strength to do it too. I didn't have it at the time, so um, it got really messy. But uh, 
I have learned a lot from that. And I'm, I'm not glad it happened, but I know why it did. I don't think any of the rest of us should be commenting on what's right or wrong unless, unless one of us is perfect. The story of Leanne and Eddie's love affair broke quickly when Us Weekly posted a video of the pair together in a restaurant. What ensued was a tabloid feeding frenzy that rapidly progressed into a full frontal assault on Leanne Rhymes. It doesn't matter what part of the, of the entertainment world that you work in, the tabloids are going to dog you. The stalker thing, I mean, we've talked about this before, but that made me just I, angered the hell out of me. And I shouldn't even say that because I don't want anybody to know that it did. But, um, but it did because it was such a lie. And, and, and that just started the lies. It just started, you know. The only thing that was truthful about the whole situation, the whole situation, was what originally happened. Other than that, everything that's been said has been a lie. They can take a grain of truth and turn it into a huge boulder that can flatten you on its way to the newsstands. And I think that's what happened to her. Well, I hate to be lied about, to be honest. And, and you know, to make a mistake, in front of the public eye um, and to have to uh, navigate it, navigate a divorce, navigate a new relationship, um, children involved, you know, like, it, that's what upsets me is to, is that people, you know, you have the world watching and like, you're going, hold on a second, I'm just trying to figure this out. You guys have figured it out for me. You guys have written the story before I've even had a chance to figure it out. Leanne is really tough. So Leanne, with all the press and everything outside, she's, she's very stoic. And, but behind the scenes, it would really bother her. And it was, she felt it was just hurtful to the people around her mom and other people. She felt very hurtful and that, that, that's what she didn't want to have happen. There was moments and days I would not get off the couch. So just like anyone else, you know, I'm not exempt because I'm, you know, a celebrity. Coming up on Backstory. Guess what? Yep, I did it. And I did that, and I did that. And so what, what am I going to do about it now except make the future better? When Leanne Rhymes was caught in an affair with a married man, actor Eddie Cibrian, the tabloids feasted on the story. With her own marriage to Dean Charmay on the line, Leanne retreated to her L.A. home, attempting to ride out the storm in private. But soon, family and friends rallied to Leanne's side to help her face the storm head on. I went out to L.A., and Leanne was getting pretty well beat up in the, in the, in the rags. And I was going to go and have dinner that night. And she said, I'm not going to have dinner tonight. Let's just cancel. I said, no, I'm coming. And I went to her house. and. And that was the night I, I felt much, I said, you can fire me as your agent, but you can't fire me as your friend and your, and, and like a parent, I would be like a parent, and you are gonna change this. You just share the hurt, you know? But you also share the joy of when someone blossoms after the hurt, you know? And I think that's, that's what like, you know, whether it be somebody's alcoholism or somebody's addiction or somebody coming through with some of the trauma, you don't want someone to be stuck in trauma for the rest of their life. You don't want that to define who they are. I think I'm so much m more honest these days than I've ever been. Um, because what else, you know, when you go through something like that publicly, what else is there to hide? I have nothing to hide. <laughs> nothing. Like, it's, it's all out there. Once the truth was exposed, Leanne and Eddie had some difficult decisions to make. Unsure that they could salvage any shred of their respective marriages, they both tried to move forward, albeit separately. I didn't confirm nor deny it. Um, and he denied it. With two kids, I think it was like, well, we're going to take our own paths here, and we're going to figure this out. Um, and uh, we both tried um, and worked at our own marriages, um, but we both knew it wasn't working. So... Um, and with two kids involved, it was a much harder decision for him to make. And the decision, I think that what people don't understand, the decision wasn't about Dean or Eddie. Like, the decision was about whether or not I was in the right place. 
For Leanne, finding the right place in life hasn't been an easy journey, and gaining acceptance, even within the music industry, was never a foregone conclusion. It's such a double standard. My God, country music, it's like, you know, Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and all of these guys, you know, God knows what they did back in the day. And, um, you know, if a woman did it, it was, oh, it was, you never were accepted or forgiven. But it was, if it was a guy, it was just their life, you know, and uh, they could write about it and songs be huge and still move on. Um, but it's, it is, it's, it's, just, it's quite interesting to have to navigate those waters as a woman in this business. And um, we forget that we all make mistakes, large, small, some are larger than others. We just do. So that's what, you know, I've, uh, I've learned that, well, guess what? Yep, I did it. And I did that, and I did that. And so what, what am I going to do about it now except make the future better? I can't take that away, and it's part of who I am. And it's part of my lesson. You know, I truly believe that everything that we do is, is part of our lessons in life. So hopefully you learn from it and you move on. If not, you keep making them until you do. I look at um, Leanne and Eddie. Um, I see God has kind of carved out new and better for them, you know? <laughs> Today, Leanne and Eddie are sharing life together, thankful for the broken pieces that have come together to make them whole. We really do have a very deep connection with each other, and it's very sweet. I mean, I just, we've gone through so much together, and, um, and really had to learn, you know, we, we trust each other and we, and you know, I think coming from where we came from, that was something we had to learn to do, you know? Um, we've had an interesting build on our relationship. We take a lot of blows and we have made it through it and we're really happy and his kids are great and I'm a stepmom and that's, you know, crazy to me. I, I said, I open up my car door and I see it car seat in the back and I'm still like hold on yes that's supposed to be there um <laughs> but it's you know those two little children are so sweet and so beautiful and they've brought so much joy to my life so um it's definitely come with many many layers of stuff These days, Leanne Rhymes can be found exploring a wide range of music in the studio. A recent collaboration with Daryl Brown and Vince Gill produced a unique collection of some of Leanne's favorite country love songs, aptly titled Lady and Gentleman. Lady and Gentleman was definitely a concept record from front to back. My friend Daryl Brown called me and said, hey, let's I have this idea for this record. You should do your favorite country classic love songs record. We were sitting in our house, and we were going through about 120 songs. Help me make it through the night. 16 tons. He stopped loving her in a day. Rose-colored glasses. And I realized they were all men's songs, so every single song on the record was recorded originally by a man. He's an apple of my island, I'm with him, it makes me almost high. He's been a sense of spring on the front porch in the spring. One of the songs was Vince Gill's song, uh, When I Call Your Name. So I called Vince and said, hey, would you come play and sing on the record? And then it kind of turned into, hey, will you produce the record? And uh, so it was, it was an amazing experience working with him as an artist. And, you know, obviously with Swingin', you can see we took Swingin' and made it completely different. Vince is, you know, he's traditional. He's got that stuff. And we went like, hey, can we triple time the song? <laughs> you know, and he, and he started playing that little guitar lick. And we knew we had, had the, something new. Although some artists may have buckled under the pressure of such a public life, Leanne Rhymes has faced it with dignity. After more than 20 years in the spotlight, she's still a young woman with plenty of life left in front of her. So I'm just growing up. I'm still growing up, God. Uh, and certain parts of me are still very childlike, which is good in a way, and also like sometimes it can be scary because you know you're having to project this, I'm in control all the time, and I know what I'm doing. Somewhere deep inside you're like, um, to really know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, you know, how did I get here? You know, so it's, 
yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> if you, uh, you know, if you really sit and analyze my life, it's, it's been quite the ride. can't fight this public, like, you know, scrutiny. It's so, and when you're going, this is not who I am. What, what happened is not who I am. It's, it's not me at all, so. And you keep saying that, saying that. It's like, oh my God, it's never gonna end. But um, it changes, time changes things. You know, it's that's my life, and I, you know, I've, I've learned not to. I've learned that the um, the imperfections have are, have been what's made my life story so interesting and so real, and it's made made me human, and it's made for some great songs. So you know, the imperfections. It's just life's messy. It's what happens, and you make the best of it. And thank God I can write and turn something bad into something good. Sure.